everybody, no matter where you happen to be around the world. I know it's afternoon in Alaska, uh, but it's not afternoon maybe where you are, and especially where I am. I'm in Maine right now. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org, and I'm along with park rangers Naomi Boak and Felicia Jimenez, who are at Brooks River. It's afternoon for them right now, and I'm glad that they're here to share their experience with us for the first play-by-play -play of 2000. And 23 Rangers, how are you doing this afternoon? We're fine. Um, we're uh, actually probably glad to be inside because it looks like storms are coming. So we'll just watch them from inside. Yeah, yeah it does um, look like kind of a jury day, huh? Sorry, Felicia, I stepped on you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but we were able to be outside when it was sunny. So all is good. Yeah, we're, I, a lot of people are waiting with anticipation for more bears to arrive at Brooks River. Sometimes we have good numbers of bears fishing at Brooks River by this time in June. It's only June 22nd, though, so there's still a lot of the summer uh, to go. It's not uncommon to have an empty river at this time of the year, but we're looking for salmon to arrive. We're looking for the bears to arrive. We have a lot of different views to share with everybody today. We're going to try to get to some viewer questions along the way as well. So we're looking at uh, live footage of the Brooks Falls camera, uh, again, in the heart of Katmai National Park. This is one of the cameras that we'll be focusing on today. We also have um, just below that sort of an, a bear's eye view of the water that we'll take a look at called our Falls Low Cam. The Riffles camera located about 100 yards downstream of Brooks Falls. And then farther downstream at near the river mouth, maybe about a half mile downstream or so, uh, as a bird flies, uh, we have the, the river watch camera. We have Cat's River View looking out towards the river mouth. And then uh, the underwater camera uh, looking for fish, looking for those first salmon to arrive. And then uh, if it clears up, maybe and we get some views of the distant mountains, maybe we'll go up to Dumpling and, uh, and talk about what's happening uh, there. I know a lot of people are uh, tuning in maybe for the first time, maybe wondering where is Brooks River? Where are the webcams? So as I like to do for our play by plays at the beginning, let's take a quick tour. And we're gonna travel, travel to remote Alaska, Katmai National Park. It's about 300 miles Southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, Brooks Falls bisects the somewhat short Brooks River. Brooks River is only a mile and a half long but along with the National Park Service, Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams at Brooks River. And the signal from those webcams is sent to a radio repeater, actually two of them on top of Dumpling Mountain. And those repeaters then send the signal to the small town of King Salmon, which is where the park headquarters are located, about 30 miles away. So it's, it's miraculous that we can sort of get this technology uh, into the area to begin with and then get the signal out. I'm always quite, kind of amazed that it's uh, it's possible to do so. Uh, and taking a look at the river itself. So let's zoom in on the lower half of Brooks River. So this is Brooks River. You can see Brooks Falls on the left-hand side of the image, highlighted here by the star on the left-hand side, Brooks Camp Visitor Center near uh, Naknek Lake on the right. So in this image, the water is flowing from left to right. Brooks Falls camera is located right at that star and this is about its line of this is about its line of sight. So it's going to give us um, somewhat of a, a fairly limited perspective on the river overall, but we do get to see quite a bit of activity uh, downstream from the Brooks Falls camera from time to time. And Rangers, I'm, I'm curious to know, um, you know, when you're standing on the Falls platform, for instance, uh, where are you looking? I know a lot of us like to look straight into the water in front of us because there could be bears there, but um, that's not the only place to look. Am I, am I incorrect in that? Um, no, that isn't. Um, I personally, besides looking at the water, I like to look underneath the platform as well um, and off to the side where uh, maybe the lower uh, camera can see and there's a lot of traffic under there too. Yeah, and also behind the platform, um, I know in past years I've uh, spotted Otis napping back there. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, a sub-adult might, might bring its food back there because, right, it doesn't want to 
eat right down below the falls because um, a more dominant bear might uh, take it away from him or her. Um, sometimes there's a cub treed right there while mom fishes. So right in front of you, in front of the falls is not the only place to look. And that's often why you'll see the, the camera panning from place to place looking for bears. And we do have a few camera operators driving the cameras right now, thanks to all of our volunteer camera operators who make um, these views possible. So yeah, live footage coming to you from uh, Brooks Falls in Katmai. So that's the falls cam. Um, Again, most of the time it's going to be focused right next to that star at the waterfall itself, but occasionally it will pan downstream to um, a different location. We have a different uh, camera near there that gives us a great line of sight, and that's the Riffles camera. It mostly looks uh, right in front of it as well uh, as looking upstream towards uh, Brooks Falls itself. And Rangers, when you're going to the Riffles, um, in contrast to maybe what you see at the falls um you know what how does the the bear and the salmon activity differ from this location compared to brooks falls which is just upstream um from the ripples platform uh, it does differ <clears throat> quite a bit um you see a lot of the less dominant bears hang out in that area so it's a really good place to see sows with cubs and sub adults as they try and catch the leftover carcasses that from the bigger bears um and yeah there's a lot of activity to watch down there yeah and um for those who've watched the cams for a while and um you know 151 walker who is um changing his habits some um he used to hang out at the riffles before he got to be um a little older and more aggressive and wanting to rise in the hierarchy he would get fat by fishing in the riffles and only go to the falls later in the season where he didn't really have to compete with other big bears. And also this view is fantastic because you can see what's going on um, at the falls. When I go to the falls, I usually go to the riffles platform first just to see what's going on and see what's happening at the falls and get a kind of wider view. And then I go to the falls. Yeah, this is definitely a camera to watch for different activity, different bears doing different things. Uh, of course, there, there uh, I mentioned before, there's other cameras that we have the opportunity to look at uh, today and in the future. So looking at our, our river uh, watch camera, this one uh, looks at sort of half of the lower river area, as I like to call it. Uh, it's located uh, on the north side of the river, kind of attached to uh, the bridge across of Brooks River itself and its line of sight gives us a, a great opportunity to look at some of the more diverse habitats along the river itself. So you're not just seeing water and trees, but you're seeing uh, marshes, you're seeing oxbow bends. Uh, this is a, a, a great place for a lot of wildlife to be hanging out uh, throughout the summertime. So it's a spot that I like to uh, pay attention to when, I'm, when I have the opportunity to not only watch the cameras, but be at Brooks River in, in person. And also at this time, um, the um, the new, brand new merganser chicks are hanging out just to the left of there, but they will they will swim by. So it's a really good place to watch them. Um, other ducks, um, one just flew by. Um, so it's great for wildlife and at different times in the season, bears. So the, yeah, this camera is attached to the bridge over across Brooks River itself. We have uh, two other cameras that are attached to the bridge and streaming live uh, right now. The next one that we'll talk about briefly and introduce is the underwater camera, which is uh, one of my favorites at Brooks River. This is right in the middle of the bridge, practically. It's a little bit um, more north than south across the middle of the bridge, uh, but uh, it's underwater. It's attached to a piling. It looks on the downstream side of the bridge towards Naknek Lake. Its line of sight is pretty limited, but there's often really wonderful action on the underwater camera. Right now, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like <laughs> too much, uh, does it, Felicia and, and Naomi? But, um, you know, what can we expect to see here coming up uh, in, well, the next uh, couple of weeks and, and couple of months, especially? 
Um, I love this camera <laughs> a lot, actually. Um, yeah, me so too. when the salmon start making their migration, we'll be able to see them on the lower, I mean, on the underwater camera, they'll be silver as they begin their migration and we'll get to see those waves of salmon come in. Um, and then later on throughout the season as the sockeye spawn and reach their, their um, spawning grounds and they start deteriorating in their body as they've expended all of that energy they'll make that transformation and become that beautiful red sockeye that we're seeing and then we'll see them again um in this camera in september as they wash up and sometimes we see bears mm -hmm. dancing and fishing there <laughs> and um the other day i didn't see it but someone posted um some video of uh diving ducks in front of the underwater cam so it's always surprising and one year um at, um some of the salmon even looked like they were spawning right in front of it um but mike the underwater camera also provides opportunities for kayaking for rangers right mike <laughs> <laughs> i guess so yeah if, uh, occasionally someone got to clean the the housing on the camera um, bring up a picture of that one more time. That gets uh, a lot of a lot of fuzz on it um, uh, during the, during the year. So got to clean that off somehow. Sometimes you got to get out there in a canoe or a kayak, or if it's warm enough and the water's not too deep and there are no bears in the vicinity and people are watching for uh, for bears for you, you can get in the water, uh, take a chilly swim, grab a scrub brush, and just do it by hand if necessary. So I think um, we've. We've done and collectively all of those things uh, over time. So um, this year, but yeah, this year we have a really crisp, clear views so far. The water's been pretty cold, so not a lot of algal growth uh, starting on the underwater cam yet. Nope. But I, I expect that to change. However, one of the tech crew did have to go out there and clean the cam at the before the cams came on, and um, I must say it was a valiant act because. The winds were blowing it, like gusting at forty-five to fifty miles per hour. Um, the the you know the tide was really strong, so um, it is clean because of the noble effort of one of um, Explorer's tech crew. Well, thanks to them. Yeah, it sounds like that was a terrible day to do it, <laughs> but you got to got to do what you got to do. <laughs> Um, yeah, underwater camera is going to be fun to watch this year. Check it out. It is, like Felicia said, one of the best cameras to, to watch at Brooks River. One more camera to introduce before we go back to our, our live footage and maybe answer viewers' questions, talk about some other things that come up, uh, is uh, what we formerly called uh, the Lower River camera itself, rechristened Cats Riverview after our longtime lead of camera operations. Um, Cam up cat. So this one is on the south side of the bridge at the mouth of the river, and it's looking out towards Naknek Lake itself. So it'll pan in different directions. You'll see gravel bars there. Uh, and this this is a, a, a dynamic view throughout the year. You'll see the water level rise in the lake itself. So a lot of the thing, the places where, where ducks and maybe uh, bears are resting at this time of the year, those will be covered over by water. Uh, later in the year itself. Uh, it can be great for sunrise. Uh, if you are awake uh, when sunrise happens in Alaska, um, and that sometimes can be easy to do if you're maybe on the east coast of the United States or in Europe, really wonderful um, for sunsets. Uh, Rangers, how does the how does the scene here change over time? I mean, I talked about the water levels itself, but what might we expect bears to do here in July versus uh, what we might see in September and October? Well, this is really a great view because it's used by everybody, <clears throat> mostly family groups. But um, in mid-July, when the sub-adults kind of find each other, it's kind of like West Side Story, only on the east side of the bridge. Um, the, I call them gangs of subadults, and they're racing back and forth on the spit. And sometimes they have encounters with family groups, and sows aren't very happy about that. Um, there are a couple eagles that like to go out there. Of course, there are lots of gulls um, once the bears uh, provide some salmon bits for them. Um, and of course, in the fall, we see bear 435 holly out there nonstop fishing. So it's, it's a great view.
Yeah, so that's a little bit of a, a lengthy tour of our an introduction to many of the cameras that we have at Brooks River. Um, actually, let's cut to Dumpling real quick because we're just getting a peek through the clouds right now. This is the Dumpling camera is sort of pointed towards Brooks River. That um, sort of blob that you see at center right that is Lake Brooks, and that's where um, Brooks River begins at Lake Brooks. Um, on a clear day, you can see basically the entirety of Brooks River from this point of view, but right now it's just a little bit too cloudy for that. Hopefully we'll be able to highlight that during um, future play-by-plays. Down at, down at Brooks Falls, though, um, still pretty quiet. And I know um, people have really been wondering where are the bears, where are the salmon, and maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about those things, where the salmon are coming from. Um, and when they should get here and when will the bears arrive. So I know it's it, a lot of this is gonna be speculation because we can't ask the bears and salmon directly, why aren't you here right now? But we have some pretty uh, good ideas. Uh, but you know, Naomi and Felicia, maybe we could start with you describing sort of like the basic pattern of bear activity at Brooks River and salmon as well. So what, um, maybe Felicia, I know that you know, you're, you're into, you, you love talking about salmon. So could you uh, talk a little bit about when the the salmon arrive and when the peak of their migration is yeah um this is around the time of year where <clears throat> salmon might typically start to arrive um we had a really long winter this year so they're coming in a little bit later we'll see that shift um, but typically it's supposed to be around this time of year the salmon start showing up making that escapement um, coming up the mouth of brooks river um, and making their way through and then in July is when we get that peak salmon migration. Um, so they are moving up in massive numbers up through the Brooks River and then they have to make that leap over Brooks Falls. Um, we'll see that congregation, this natural barrier to them. Um, and that's where the bears will start to gather and catch the salmon. Um, so they'll make their way through the river into Brooks Lake through all the smaller tributaries and streams throughout that watershed. Um, and then in August, that's when they'll make their way through there. And then September, they start dying off after that spawning and their carcasses will wash up lower in the river downstream around September. So that's when we see another congregation of bears in the lower river um, because that's where all the salmon are going. Or gone as that one <laughs> shows us. Yeah, so so um, you know the salmon they have this this really uh, you uh, remarkable migration right um, coming from Bristol Bay. So in this map here, the uh, what you're seeing is is Quechac Bay, just like, kind of like a narrow neck of of larger Bristol Bay as a whole, and um, finding their way up Naknek River when they enter fresh waters about thirty miles into Naknek Lake. And then they have to swim up another 30 miles to get to Brooks River. They're, they're remembering their way back home because when they were juvenile salmon, they imprinted on the unique chemical signatures of the streams that they passed through on their out migration. And they're remembering that when they're coming back. So these, uh, these fish really are incredible animals. They are the keystone of the ecosystem. We can't give them enough praise for what they're able to accomplish um, in, their, in their lives. So yeah, really special animals themselves. And of course, uh, since they're serving as the back backbone of the ecosystem, Naomi, they attract um, predators to places where the salmon are vulnerable. The salmon are really uh, strong athletes for, I, I guess, is a great way to describe them because when they re-enter fresh water, they don't eat, they stop feeding, and they're fueling their migration and spawning activity. And sometimes that is like a couple months of, of time where they're not eating. Uh, during migration and spawning so it's really remarkable what they're able to do uh, but they get to places like brooks falls like we're looking at right now and they're vulnerable to predators and bears recognize that so uh when when do we really start to see a lot of bears arriving at brooks river naomi and and um and how are they taking advantage of salmon in this location well where where the salmon go so do the bears um I mean, I want to make one more comment about the salmon um they are remarkable and they've got predators pounding them throughout their life cycle. When they're young and growing up in the river and then slowly migrating in different stages, going out to the ocean, they've got predators. I mean, they've got trout eating their eggs. They've got 
birds eating the eggs and the and and the young fry um and then when they're out in the ocean they've got predators and they're sort of the bears seem to be their their last gauntlet um and um you know it seems a little late for the bears this year compared to recent years um i think that the long winter may have affected them as well um i mike you may know this better than i but i'm assuming that there are environmental triggers um that will key a bear's journey to its favorite hunting grounds and in our case here at on on the brooks river um do you think that's true maybe it's it's i don't think it's really well understood amongst um amongst biologists at least not from what i've i've read uh bears they seem to have no matter if they're black bears polar bears or or brown bears and only only brown bears in katmai national park alaska but all three of those species in north america seem to have this remarkable ability to go to the places where they know there's food at the right time of the year because again it wouldn't make sense to show up at brooks river uh and and try to fish for salmon in april because there's no there's no salmon around uh and the bears realize that so not only do they know that this is a place where they can fish but they know the time of the year when that happens and that um so the, they're how they're how they're doing that we're not really sure uh, but there could be other triggers um, like the maybe they're uh, you know it's learned instinct of course they they learn this through experience but maybe they're also you know queuing in on other other things such as like the business um, and I'm again I'm just speculating but maybe like the phenology of the plants themselves maybe they need to get to a certain point where they're green enough um, and that's also like one of those signs that a bear has sort of uh, internalized in its brain that says hey let's travel to Brooks River and maybe there's some fish there. I also think that when there's a, the, like a first few really big pulses of salmon in the, in the water, uh, that you know all of their splashing sort of kicks up a bit of a scent in the air. And again, don't know this for sure, but a bear's sense of smell is so incredible that I bet they can sort of smell that. They can't smell into the water themselves, but if there is sort of mist and, and haze that carries a little bit of, of salmon scent into the air, then um, that might also, um, you know, it encourage them to get to the river. Sometimes you'll see a bear sort of show up at the river mouth. Um, I think rangers, you probably have seen this too. Um, but uh, like on the spit out at the gravel bar, you'll see the, a spot where a bear had eaten the salmon before. And then a new bear shows up at Brooks River and it's just kind of walking along lazily. And then all of a sudden it catches, it lifts its head up. It seems like it catches the sense of where that other salmon was. And it, it just makes a beeline straight for that. So I, I bet there's uh, multiple cues that help encourage the bears to get to the river. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's so interesting to watch the stages of when they come. I mean, I <clears throat> I remember um, a couple years ago when Lefty showed up um, from, was coming from Lake Brooks to the top of the falls and the salmon hadn't arrived yet. And he just took one look around and Lefty left. And, um, you know, so their timing is, you know, is, is a bit of a, a mystery, but um, we have seen some bears and um, are anxiously awaiting the others. There are all those mysteries yet to come. Yeah, so if you're wondering where the bears are, um, they're coming for sure. And the salmon are coming as well. Just, um, you know, we're gonna have to be patient for at least a few more days or so. But by the end of the month, I expect that we'll see some pretty good pulses of salmon. Typically, that's the case, and then also um, good numbers of bears at the river. That doesn't mean that um, bears haven't been around, though. As you know, as, as Naomi just mentioned, um, definitely there's bears around the river. So maybe this is a good opportunity. Uh, we're almost halfway through our broadcast already, uh, but this is a good opportunity to look back at some of the some of the clips of bears that we've seen at the river um, this year, perhaps starting with, and I know the both of you have seen this bear in person, and a lot of our cam viewers are very excited to see um, this bear, uh, number 901, and her uh, three spring cubs. So she's a first time mother. And we, usually we don't see spring cubs at Brooks River so early in June. Usually it's a little bit later. Uh, she's a marvel to see. And um, it's interesting, I don't know how much Bear Cam viewers have been able to watch 901 because she 
hangs out on the beach of Knack Knack, and which we don't have a camera there. I mean, we see this section of the beach, but there's a long stretch of beach where there are no cameras, and she is a beach girl. And look how fat she is. Isn't that great? She had three cubs, and they're all sizable um, and very active, and she does not look scrawny. That's pretty incredible to me. Yeah, she has done uh, pretty well for herself over the winter. I suspect, though, that if she was wet, she would look a little bit, um, <laughs> a little bit skinnier than she actually is. But just, just to think about how the, the, the direct transfer of fat, uh, and how that has supported the growth of her three cubs, because bear cubs are born in the winter, uh, when mom is essentially hibernating. She doesn't eat during that time of the year except for maybe like, um, you know, any of the, any of the things that the cubs avoid, uh, she's maybe going to, you know, lick to keep the, keep the den clean, but that's about it. She's not really getting, um, you know, extra nutrition from outside of the den. So she is surviving and subsisting on her fat reserves. And those fat reserves are also being uh, drawn to produce milk for her cubs. So her cubs, even at this time of the year, are really kind of like a direct product of her uh, fat reserves. And there are, um, there's a, a question about nursing that came in in advance. And thanks for everybody who did submit questions um, in advance for any of our live events. You can do that through what we call uh, uh, a Google form called Ask Your Bear Camp Question. We'll get back to um, talking about 901 here in just a bit. But if you wanna submit any of your questions in advance for any of our live events, you can do it uh, through this form. Look for it. Uh, a link to it in the featured comment. Also ask a mod um, to point you in the right direction if you can't find it. But yeah, uh, 901 doing really, really good for herself. And a, a question that somebody was wondering about uh, regarding this doesn't have to do necessarily with spring cubs, but in a sense it, it does. Because uh, somebody was wondering uh, about female bears nursing their yearling cubs so early in the season when their own fat reserves are scarce before uh, the salmon run. And as I understand it, yeah, you'll see yearling uh, bears nurse, you'll see especially spring cubs nurse. Uh, but maybe this, uh, we can talk about how it's different for spring cubs versus yearlings, because yearlings are more mature, their digestive system is more mature, able to handle uh, different foods that they can find in the wild. But spring cubs are basically dependent on mother's milk at this time of the year. And and this is 901's first litter. So it's a new new world for her. Steep learning curve for sure. Uh, mother bears, they're gonna nurse their cubs basically as long as they're taking care of them. Uh, I've even seen big two and a half year old, almost three year old cubs a suckle milk from mom, but at that stage in their life, they do not need mother's milk. It's maybe more of a treat for them than, than anything else. Cause uh, after a, a cub gets to about uh, like seven or eight months old, then at that point in time, its digestive system is mature enough and it has enough teeth to be able to eat other foods besides mother's milk. But at this time of the year, yeah. Um, mother bears, if they're nursing their cubs, they're pulling directly off of their fat reserves. So it's, um, you know, not only do you have to think about bears preparing for hibernation, um, but also how bears are surviving through spring um, during the season when essentially they have only grasses uh, to eat in the Brooks River area before the salmon arrive. So Mike, um, question, do um, sows nurse their cubs after their first season in the den? Not in the den as far as I know. I haven't read any descriptions of that happening, um, not from wild bears, not from uh, captive bears. So it's really only those newborn cubs that are nursing in the den. And if you think about it, that makes sense. You wouldn't want to try to, um, to nurse a, a yearling bear that weighs something like, in, you know, when it goes into the den, it might weigh like 80 pounds or so. Um, you know, think about all, all the feces and urine it would produce if it's still nursing in the den. Think about the energy that, would, that, would, that it would take uh, to, to nurse a, a, an active cub through the entirety of the winter. So I don't think female bears have that, that energetic capacity. So it's only those newborn cubs that are nursing in, in, in the den. After that, they're surviving on their fat reserves like mother. 
<laughs> Stepping over mm -hmm. that cub is so cute. And you can notice natal collars on these cubs, too. Yeah, that, that'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to see if they keep those throughout the year. Often spring cubs do through their first year itself, but one of them has a very prominent natal collar. You see differences in size as well. I think we'll get to know these cubs probably, probably pretty well. Um, 901, she's fairly easy to recognize without the cubs. Now that she has cubs, she'll be easy to pick out of, of a crowd itself. All right. Uh, and, you know, back to live footage here, looking at um, the lower Brooks River, still a really quiet day overall. Um, so nothing on Cats Riverview right now. We're still looking, um, you know, on the Riverwatch camera, empty river there, empty river at Riffles, and empty rivers um, up towards Brooks Falls itself. Thankfully, though, uh, I prepped some other clips to help us talk about some of the bear activity that's happened in the last um, week or so. And if you're just joining us, thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Mike Fitz with explore.org and I'm alongside Katmai National Park Rangers, Naomi Boak and Felicia Jimenez who are at Brooks River um, on the ground with their eyes and their ears and all of their senses to, to help us have a, a better bear cam uh, watching experience. Uh, so, so yeah, we have, uh, again, different questions coming in uh, about some different topics. One of the things um, that maybe we can talk about too happens to do with um, number uh, 747 and his exploits recently with um, female bears. <laughs> 747 is a very dominant bear at Brooks River. He's the largest bear that I have ever seen. And right now he's patrolling the river for females who are in estrus. And this is the mating season for bears. It's kind of like the peak of the mating season. Um, we have seen 747 uh, cruising the landscape um, right behind um, some female bears recently, including uh, number 909 who recently separated from her two and a half year old offspring. So this is 909 here. Um, and shortly you'll see a bigger bear come up right behind her. Uh, so Felicia, when we're watching the, the, the cams, how can you tell sort of like courting behavior versus, you know, just two bears that happen to be in the same vicinity of one another? Um, courting can actually be quite a long process. Um, you'll be able to tell it's courting versus just coincidental two bears next to each other because you'll see these two bears together for maybe weeks at a time. I know for myself, I saw these two bears walking around 747 following 909 for at least a week, a week and a half. Um, I actually saw 747 on the road walking to work about two days ago and he was by himself. So I think um, the deed has been done. <laughs> um, <laughs> but and yeah, according behavior, you see how persistent he is in following her and like, he just keeps on going. <laughs> I think there, there are two interesting things about this. One is um, that um, he was pursuing 128 earlier, which, um, which I saw when she still had one cub and he was not happy, jaw popping. She was running away from him. Um, and um, I'm not sure how that ended up. Um, but that was not a happy courting situation. The other thing that I've noted is that there were a couple of um, large male bears around um, earlier this season, but they're not around now. And I find that very interesting that um, maybe a comment on 747's dominance, maybe another comment on the number and kind of females that are around here, but uh, 747 has in the last couple of weeks been the only male bear that we've seen um, in courting behavior. Yeah, it, it, 747 is such a giant that he doesn't really have competition for these types of opportunities, right? And that's the advantage of being so big. If you're looking at uh, a bear that's like 1,200 pounds uh, in, at the end of the year, at least if not closer to 1,400 pounds, this is him. This is one of the largest brown bears on earth. So, I mean, he's an amazing individual to watch, not only for his size, but to think about the advantages as we, I'll back this up and start it again, the advantages that he gains through his body size overall. So he, 
you know, if there's a younger male in the vicinity or a less dominant bear or a smaller bear, they're not going to even think about tangling with 747. And here he is. This is also an interesting part of this clip where he's marking uh, this tree uh, just to let other bears know that he's in the area. And there also could be some signaling um, going on uh, between bears, uh, visual signaling going on when they're marking trees like this. I'm not sure if like that helps to stimulate the female bears in any sense, but with some other species, I, I think with like pandas, wild pandas, there needs to be, um, you know, uh, maybe quite a bit of courtship going on besides just two bears sort of like hooking up. And sometimes they'll do that too. Sometimes two bears come into the, into the area at the right time in the right place. And they're like, okay, yeah. Um, you know, everything let's, let's, um, let's get this over with. But, um, I'll, yeah, like Felicia said, often it's a long process, sometimes a week or more, depending on the female's receptivity. And, uh, that, that brings us uh, to an audience question, um, that I saw, uh, earlier. So let me bring that up for everybody here. <coughs> And this one has to do with female choice. We talk about males and how they're cruising the landscape. They're looking for those mating opportunities and how there's limited mating opportunities for males at any time of the year. Um, but somebody was wondering about the females. Can a female bear refuse to mate with a male or is it inevitable that he will catch her due to the male's size and strength? So do you have any um, thoughts or opinions on that? Oh, I do on that. <clears throat> this is... Uh female's choice. Um, you know, it truly is a courtship. And, um, and even watching 747, he classically is a very patient bear when it comes to mating. Um, we've seen him court 284 for weeks. Um, we've seen him court in old days 410. And 410 in her really late years when she probably wasn't going wasn't really viable. Um, I don't know if she was going into estrus, but um, he was doing that when she was like 28, 27 years old. Um, so, um, but it's the, it's the female's decision. I mean, 128 was not saying yes to 747, but um, 909 seems much more amenable. Any thoughts on that, Felicia? Um, no, I think I mirror what Naomi says. Um, this is truly probably female's choice. They have, you know, the pick. Um, males certainly have the advantage with size and strength, um, and that's what they use to attract me. But females, it really comes down to their choice. And the, the classically, uh, or sort of like the classic descriptions or like the oldest descriptions of, of bear courtship and behavior uh, probably were written down by men, um, you know, dudes who looked like me, <laughs> thought about the world maybe a little bit like me. So they were looking at it from the male's perspective, right? Um, rather than maybe what the females um, can choose. And in, in places where there's fewer bears, um, sometimes it's like the female, you know, she has such a large home range that maybe there's just, um, you know, one like big male who's courting her at that, that moment in time. And that's kind of like the only option that's available. We've seen some interesting behavior of bears during the mating season in the past. I can remember with Divot, for example, where like she was uh, being followed by 856 very closely, or maybe even 747, I can't remember which, but it really looked like she was, uh, she was near another large bear, one we call uh, number 32, he's nicknamed Chunk. And it was almost like, she was like, come on, Chunk, can you, can you help me out here? Uh, you know, it was almost like she wanted to be closer to him than these other bears. So I think female bears might have the ability to express some choice. And it really kind of comes down to whether or not it's, it's um, you know, she's how receptive she is to that other bear, how habituated she is to that male bear. Um, and also whether there are other males in the vicinity who might be able to compete and challenge for that. So I do think female bears certainly can express more choice than we maybe we currently know about. I think it'd be um, you know, we need some uh, some more careful observation, individual observations um, to, to know that for sure. But in a place like Brooks River, that's just hard to do because we have so many trees blocking the landscape. So we get these glimpses, right? We get glimpses of, of courting bears crossing the river in the riffles or down at the river mouth or something like that. But then, um, you know, we don't know what happens for, you know, hours or days beyond that interesting to speculate about um so that's one of the questions that i wanted to bring up thanks for 
uh, Rangers for helping to to talk our way uh, through through that one. I also think that Divot's a great example because when she's single, she's kind of the belle of the ball, and you can see a number of males following her. Um, she, you know, is very attractive. There's probably that uh, aspect of it as well. That, um, again, you know, in, in a in a population where there aren't many bears across the landscape, maybe that's that opportunity isn't available. But in a place like Katmai National Park, with some of the highest densities of bears anywhere in the world, then yeah, there could be those situations where you know there's multiple males, you know, looking to compete for access to a mating opportunity. Or there's, you know, maybe more than one female at Brooks River who's experiencing, um, you know, the peak of her estrus cycle. So a bear like 747 or Chunk or whoever, you know, has to choose like, hey, I can't, I can't be next to them both at the same time because they're going to do their own thing. So I got to make a choice here. Um, and bears, they certainly do uh, make those choices overall. And a question that just came in through um, our live chat right now is uh, about the length of the mating season. How long is the mating season? So Rangers, yeah, maybe talk about how, uh, you know, how that, that picks up in the springtime and, and maybe what we can expect to see through, um, through early summer. Yeah, well, they, you know, they're, the males are down here pretty early um, roaming around. And um, this really is kind of peak mating season, but we've seen them far later in, in the season courting females. So, um, you know, it speaks to uh, varying estrus cycles. And I'm going to say something about what's on the cams right now, which are sure. ducks. Mm -hmm. And it's been a wonderful ducky season. And I think we should watch what's in front of us now. Look at the ducks on the bottom of the frame. They're so great. <laughs> More ducks. Yeah, it looks like a, a small oh, group of, of mall mallards there. But... Uh, this, you know, if you watch closely the Lower Brooks River, when I was a ranger there and I was sitting on the lower platform, which is now kind of on the south side of the bridge, um, at this time of the year, that's what I was doing. Besides watching for bears, I was trying to pay really close attention to the birds. I was trying to, um, you know, listen to the calls of the warblers and the sparrows um, in the forest, in the marshes, looking for different ducks. I Once I saw a Stellar's eider at the mouth of Brooks River because I was just paying attention and it was a female. She was, you know, they're not um, too bold in their coloration. Um, but yeah, um, you can see some different things if, you, if you're careful to look. And often our, our camera viewers will, will catch uh, some really, really cool stuff uh, that otherwise, you know, I, I would miss because there's only one of me, there's only, a, you know, a couple of rangers doing bear cam work itself. And, um, and uh, you know the hive mind uh, works in in really great ways, and so we get to see a lot of different stuff. Including, in fact, I think this is a great segue into that. There's an eagle nest uh, uh, that is visible on the the Riverview camera, and um, camera uh, viewers alerted me to this. This is a new development, as I understand it, right, Rangers? Yes, mm -hmm. and exciting. We love it. Maybe we'll see some fledglings this year. Oh, that would be exciting. Yeah. I think we will. And as far as I can recall, this is um, this nest was not there last year. I think the cameras would have spotted that. Um, there's, been, there's, there's always been eagle nests along Brooks River because there's a lot of trout, there's a lot of salmon. So there's a lot of food resources available, available for bald eagles. Uh, but the most recent one that I knew about was on the upper river, way, uh, well beyond the camera's line of sight. So now we have this one in the lower river, which is great. We'll be able to watch this periodically alongside of the bears and um, and see the development of the eagle chicks over time. And we have different eagle cameras on explore.org. And, and right now, like the eagles in Iowa and the ones in off the coast of California in the Channel Islands, they are ready to fledge. They are ready to leave their nest. But these uh, chicks probably haven't even hatched yet. Uh, so I find it really remarkable and in, in interesting across different parts of North America to see how parent eagles are timing um, the laying of their eggs and their egg and the incubation of their eggs to correspond with food availability. Um, so their eggs here are going to hatch right around the time the salmon show up. So that is going to really help those young those young chicks and and the parents uh, provision those chicks with with adequate food. And then we'll see the chicks. Uh, 
fledge the eaglets fledge out of the nest you know often in september when there's a lot of dead salmon available for them um, and those those uh first uh awkward uh flights for the the eaglets the young um subadult birds you know it maybe is made a little bit easier because they have abundant food available to them more excitement hey felicia you were at the river last year so cor flight. correct me if i'm wrong um were you, yeah. were, was was this nest um there last year or is this this is something new for 2023 I don't think it was there last year. There was a pair of, um, there was a pair of eagles that was around um, the lower river, but I didn't see a nest. So I think this nest is a new development. And Naomi, I think you wanted to jump in. No, that's okay. We can move on. I'm just fascinated with the birds right now since we don't. We're not seeing a lot of bears, but there's so much other wildlife and something you won't see on the cams because you can't hear it, but there are a pair of um, yellow legs that must have a nest in the marsh just south of the bridge. And every time you walk by there, you get screamed at. I feel like I'm doing something really terrible <laughs> by walking by there, that nest vigilantly. So if you come here, and you hear birds screaming at you, that's what it is. <laughs> we were just filming something and they were screaming at us the whole time. It was great. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I don't have a picture of a yellow legs, um, but in uh, we have an audio loop on uh, the uh, this camera uh, due to privacy concerns, because we can't put a, a live microphone there because there's too many people around. So you end up hearing their conversations and the planes are extremely loud. Like you're looking at some planes that are 110, 120 decibels when they're landing and taking off. So it's kind of a noisy place overall. But in this audio loop at the beginning, um, you can hear, let me um, let me cut to uh, the other, maybe the other lower river camera and um, it'll, it'll restart the audio loop for us. Um, but yeah, you can hear the yellow legs in the background sort of yelling. You hear a sparrow chipping, but now you hear that that really persistent um, call. Yeah. And that's, that's the yellow legs. So they are very loud when you're next to them. Um, fun birds to watch, they're shore birds. So they're wading birds. Um, they're like a sandpiper, only taller. They're, they're um, similar in shape. They're just um, larger, um, larger than, than what you would you know, consider a classic uh, sandpiper. But yeah, neat animals overall, great time of the year to look for birds. Uh, at, at Brooks River. And porcupines. <laughs> oh, have you been seeing a few of those? Oh yeah, there's a resident, at least one resident porcupine under the visitor center. And he, she has been coming out on a regular basis. Um, the squirrels are here. They're, they yell at you too. Well, yeah, I look for. I'm going to be at Brooks River starting next week, so I'm looking forward to checking out that that porcupine among among other wildlife. And on the Brooks Falls camera, before I forget, um, concerning birds, we've been seeing some harlequin ducks recently as well. And I should have pulled a clip of those ducks so we can talk about them. Um, but they are very distinctive plumage. Uh, the males, especially, um, extremely sort of handsome and dapper um, in their in their colorful colorful plumage. So yeah, look for for different birds, different types of. Um, animals while we're waiting for the bears uh, to, to come by. Uh, speaking question, of the falls, sure. Uh, yeah. I have a quick question. So are harlequins um, classically seen here? I don't remember them in my time, but that doesn't mean they haven't been here. Within my experience, they, uh, I would see them once in a while. It was not something that I would see consistently, not like, you know, the common mergansers not like the mallards, not even like the green winged teals. So they were, they were something that I would see occasionally. And I think it, it might vary from year to year. Uh, for example, sometimes I would see dippers, you know, at Brooks Falls and in the riffles. Um, in some years I wouldn't. Um, the one year, uh, and I know that when dippers are in the area, sometimes they'll nest right at Brooks Falls, kind of on that far side, right, right above um, what the area we call the office where Otis the bear likes to sit. Um, there's some 
there's been some really neat dipper nests built there in years past. So I think it varies, yeah, from 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 year to year. But it's um, not a surprise to see them at Brooks River. The the river looks really high here. Does it look high to you? It does look a little bit high, yeah, um, compared to some of the springs that I've seen uh, at, at Brooks River in the past. Um, in fact, that brings us uh, uh, another question to mind. Came This question came in advance. Let me pull that up for everybody. And this is uh, concerning the, the amount of water that flows over Brooks Falls. How many gallons per minute is flowing over the falls and how does that compare to other years? So the first part of the question, I don't know. How many, you know, what's the, the flow <laughs> in the river? Uh, I, I don't, I don't Darn know. Mike. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure there isn't like a, um, like an active river gauge that you'll find on, you know, other, other rivers in different parts of the world or in the United States where the U S geological survey has that, you know, data uploaded to the, the internet where you can log in and, and see very easily. Um, so we don't, I don't know that for sure. Um, but how does this compare to other years? It's kind of like the question you were asking, Naomi, it was, I think there's a little more water um, right now than I've seen in, in years past because there's uh, often an island uh, downstream of the falls, just kind of like a, a grassy and gravel island that is sometimes exposed at this time of the year. And a lot of camp viewers are wondering whether that's eroded away and a lot of it has, but I also think we're not seeing anything there because the water level is up a little bit uh, this year as well. So it's been a pretty um, cold uh, and wet spring in the Katmai region this year. And I think that's kept the water level in uh, in Lake Brooks higher uh, than it can be this for this time of the year. And then consequently higher in, in the river. That doesn't mean it's going to stay this way throughout the summer. So we can't say, hey, a cold, wet spring is going to mean a cold, wet summer. Um, it, it could be very, very different. Katmai always surprises. We have a few minutes left in our chat here, uh, but one there's maybe a couple more questions that we can get to before we uh, sign off from our play by play today. And one of the ones that I think interesting to talk about has to do with like the conditions of the bears themselves. And this one came in from um, the live the live chat right now. So thanks for everybody who's watching us live and uh, and talking about the, and joining the conversation with us. So this person wrote in, I, I could be wrong, but it seems like the bears are coming back plumper. What factors might contribute to this? Plethora of salmon. I mean, they've had, I mean, there've been a, um, a number of years where there've been very healthy salmon runs. And I, you know, I think that they're not having that cycle of major deficit and and then um, a feast of of salmon. So they're able to they're able to hold on to some of those fat stores, which is really helpful to them in a season like this, right? Where there's really nothing there's nothing to eat. I mean, they're munching on grass, but there's really not much to eat around here. Alicia, thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, we had a record breaking salmon run last year. Um, so a lot more food. So they didn't dip into those reserves. They built more reserve than they probably normally would. So um, we'll see them probably lose a little bit of weight until the salmon come back as they're still relying on those fat reserves. Um, but they definitely look healthy. I mean, 901 showed up with three spring cubs. She um, was second place in Fat Bear Week just because of that salmon run, it was huge. You saw how big it was. Um, you saw how big she was, so. And her efforts. And her efforts, yes. absolutely. Um, so it's that it's that record-breaking salmon run. <laughs> yeah, I agree with with everything that you said. It's, it's it, they, they look really, the bears look good, partly because they haven't started to shed their fur yet, but mostly because they had a pretty good year last year and the year before and the year before because the salmon runs have been so large. So like a bear like 747, when he's, uh, we can pull that, that clip up one more time. Um, when he's, you know, again, courting um, his, uh, you know, his prospective mates, 
he is so big because he has a lot of fat left over from last year. So again, that goes back to the importance of, of you know, having abundant food for bears. They not only need food to survive winter, hiber winter, wintertime hibernation, but they need this food in the springtime when there's not a lot of food available and maybe their motivations are pointed in a different direction besides eating uh, food. So 747, you know, he can eat grass, but he's so big, it's not going to it's not worth it. He's, it's kind of like a starvation diet for him. It's different for younger bears. They can um, gain weight on vegetation much more easily than, than, um, than large bears like 747. But yeah, he is just carrying a ton of fat reserves from, from last year. Uh, he lost a lot of weight over the winter, but yeah, he sequestered so much that he's doing really well for himself. Yeah. I mean, his, his belly isn't dragging the ground, but he's still huge. Just a, a couple more minutes here in our play-by-play our -play before we sign off here. Uh, it, I think it's going to be a really exciting season. You know, we were hoping, I had my fingers crossed, hoping that we would see uh, a bear show up on the cameras uh, during our play-by-play, -play, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but that's going to change. We'll have another play-by-play -play scheduled for same bear time, same bear channel next Thursday. So join us for that. I'll be at Brooks River. So maybe we'll have the opportunity to be live at Brooks Falls. Maybe we'll be inside toggling through uh, different uh, camera locations like we are right now, depending on the weather. Uh, but I think we'll have a, uh, a lot to talk about over the next uh, few weeks. So uh, Felicia, Naomi, uh, what are you looking forward to seeing um, coming up in the next uh, several days to, to, um, to the beginning of July? <laughs> I'm excited to see more bears. <laughs> um, so right. yeah. like, apparently some salmon have been spotted in the mouth of the river. So maybe soon that means the bears are coming right behind them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, it's, it's what all the rangers are saying. We want bears. We want bears. Well, yeah, so our camera viewers who are wondering where the bears are and looking forward to their arrival with anticipation, you are not alone. The rangers are feeling uh, the same thing. It's been a fun chat um, with with you both today. Um, so, yeah, so thanks so much for, for being here and spending the time out of your afternoon to talk about bears and salmon. And um, next week, I think we'll have a lot more uh, bears to talk about. See you then. Yeah, thank you. My co-hosts for our play-by-play -play today were Katmai National Park Rangers Naomi Volk and Felicia Jimenez. My name is Mike Fitz. I'm the resident naturalist with Explore.org. Join us again for more live chats um, in the future. We got a, uh, our next live chat is Wednesday. We're going to be talking about bear hunger and how that drives a bear to make certain decisions during the summertime so they can get fat enough to survive wintertime hibernation. And then we have another play-by-play, -play, same bear time, same uh, bear channel. Until we speak again, enjoy the cameras, everybody. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you later.